Welcome back to Over the Air, IoT Connected Devices and the Journey. My name is Ryan Prosser, CEO of Very. Today, we're joined by my co-host, Bill Brock, CEO of Perdio, and Rob Russell, Head of Predictive Maintenance at Siemens. We're going to be talking about generative AI. We are overdue on this topic. Rob, thanks for being on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure being here. So for everybody knows Siemens, of course, for folks that don't know, since since I talk a little bit about that and uh, the relationship between the two. Yeah, so um, you know, at, currently we are uh, I'm a, uh, you know, head of predictive maintenance strategy and delivery within uh, within Siemens within our DI uh, factory automation area within customer services. Um, but the journey started um, back in 2015. Uh, myself and uh, the other co-founders had a, an, an idea to exploit what then was called, you know, the, the industrial internet of things. Maybe uh, people call it digitization these days. Um, but we saw a gap to utilize experience that we had from our previous career in uh, u- utilizing um, analytics to understand the health and condition of machines. Um, and that was where the sense line journey began really in 2015. We grew the company up to, you know, around about 50, 60 people. Um, and we went through an acquisition process through, through 2021 and acquired in 2022. And, and no part of part of Siemens. It's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about Gen AI. This was really core to what you guys were uh, doing at Siemens AI, correct? Yeah, it's um, you know we, we've always been uh, a company that's had AI and machine learning at the core of what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we very much focus on you know the use case and the outcome for the for the end client. Um, you know, you've got to talk a little bit about the technology that you're using to underpin that um, and. For us, it was really thinking about scale and using, you know, various computing technologies to apply scale to the analysis of data um, and getting the right outcomes to the factory operator and the maintainer. Um, but we'd always had this background sort of vision of how do we exploit a lot of the data that is actually generated by the user, as well as like looking at understanding the sensor data. There's lots of maintenance records, feedback, notes and things. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, I think it's probably just about two years ago now, right? There, there was this new technology emerged, um, and uh, our research team started looking all over this and thinking, "Wow, this is just such a perfect fit into the vision that we already had." Um, and it actually it enabled us to pull a lot of ideas that we had on our roadmap forward, thinking now we can start to be a little bit more informative and prescriptive to the user. You know, if something is going wrong in a machine, now we get the ability to look back in the history and say, "Well, in the past." Somebody resolved this by taking this type of action. You know, maybe you, you could you can apply that to what you're doing. But what's really excellent and amazing that we found about this is the way that it's able to operate in quite sparse data. Um, you know, sometimes when we're thinking about the type of feedback or the notes and the input that we get from users, it can sometimes just be a single sentence. You know, like replace bearing, right? Um, but this is just enough with some other metadata that's known about the app uh, about the asset. To get some really powerful outputs, and uh, you know, we, we've been really impressed and surprised by what we've been able to achieve with it over the last sort of six months when we've been implementing this. So, I was going to ask for an example, and you, you jumped in with a great one. I just want to double click on it, um, and then I know Bill has some questions as well. You you mentioned the ability to look backwards. Can you talk more about you know the value of that and and how that became unlocked? Why would why it was so difficult before? How it's possible now? Yeah, yeah. And, and maybe just reflecting back on sort of my wider career, you know, I used to work a lot within aerospace and defense and putting in place maintenance management systems, right? And in a lot of these like regulated sectors, you have to capture maintenance records, right? And typically people hate doing paperwork, right? And especially maintainers, right? They want to actually use their time to do valuable things like maintaining the machines. But now what we're starting to see is that we can create a a quick value return to the user uh, on that data. So they're starting to see now, wow, you know, that that information that I gave to the system to tell it how I repaired that, it's actually beneficial to me in the future. Or I can see, you know, there's an, another, uh, you know, min- maintainer that's on the different shift to me. He's always writing tons of notes in his maintenance records and I can see the dividends now, right? So it started to create a bit of a virtuous circle. Um, and what we're actually seeing a demand for now is more and more integrations into computerized maintenance management systems. You know, this is something we've always been eager to do. We want to be part of that natural workflow. 
But now we're seeing more demand from our customers to do that. So that's something we're giving more attention to as well is like, how do you integrate to these uh, human data sources as well as machine data sources? So um, some of the more interesting and compelling AI use cases I've seen have been when companies like yourself already have some good traction and you've already got products that are doing intelligent things in the market. And it's not like, hey, I'm going to take open AI and now book airline tickets. But uh, can you talk a little bit about what you already had in place and that like aha moment when you said, when you saw OpenAI's release or whether it was Llama or OpenAI and like, oh my God, this is, this is going to set what we have truly on fire. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, cause, cause I'm paying a big sort of part of what people expect from systems like ours is a lot of um, what we would maybe call prognostics or, or uh, predictive, uh, sorry, prescriptive outputs. So the system being able to tell you what to do. And these are the sort of things we've been pushing towards and trying. So. The core of what we had already built with Sensei was a, a, a data analytics pipeline that could bring in um, sensing data from machines uh, that had that reflects this, the, the varying state of the machine. So it might be things like vibration data. It could be something as simple as a temperature or a current from a machine. Um, and the AI that we had then was building models of normal behavior from machines and then identifying when that became abnormal. And we were... We, we layered on top of that, like a triaging system that we call our attention engine, because for us, the main, in, the main output was actually how much attention should the user be providing to that asset? A lot of our competitors focus on think, thinking in terms of asset health. Now we realized that you will never really truly know the health of an asset because you've not got enough sensing information. But what we can do is we can understand out of a population of maybe 500 uh, assets that are connected, so like maybe, maybe these are robots, conveyors, mixing machines across a factory, how much attention that maintenance machine maintenance team need to give to those assets on any given day. And it's very much underpinned as like a decision support system. But the next question was, okay, Rob, you've told me something's wrong with the machine. What do I do about it? And that's the question now that by implementing generative AI capability, we're able to get much closer to answering that question. And it's like you know, getting people closer to the action they should take and utilizing, you know, the skills and knowledge that's, that's been built up in the, in the system. Yeah. And um, maybe, maybe one other interesting aspect as well is there's a lot of talk within industry of, you know, the changing demographics, you know, it's almost, become, it's almost talked about so much it's become cliched, but you've got these experts that are retiring, you know, and there's. There's a guy that's been in the factory for the last 20 years and he knows when he hears that noise, it means a certain thing, right? And there's a nervousness now that these people are getting lost and, and we've got a different generation where people don't stick around in jobs for decades. You know, people move jobs quite often. We're starting to think now that maybe that knowledge base is actually the system, right? So our systems start to pick up and record and capture the corrective actions that were taken and that becomes your long-term expert. So you can mitigate some of this change in workforce that's coming around as well. And I think the Gen AI capability really lends itself to that. And that's, that's sort of part of the excitement that we're seeing uh, in what we're doing. So you guys are going to have just this incredibly powerful rolling context about a factory and floor and the, and the service. And yeah, it's really, really interesting. I like, yeah. uh, what you shared too about it, it seems like a, a much more user-centric approach to anomaly detection where it's like about the people about the factory it's not just about the the analytics and the alerts but how do people actually like how are they guided through or coached through some of these maintenance uh, workflows yeah yeah very, very much and, and we've always uh, sort of been so sort of user-centric and almost what we try to do is hide a lot of that complexity from the user. You know, when, when people see our app, it's, 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 it's deliberately very simple. Um, the, the, you know, keeping in mind, in mind that the end user is somebody that's trying to run a production line and keep that running smoothly. She doesn't want to have to think about uh, or training models or, you know, what's the, what, what's the, the, the right type of um, you know, algorithm to apply to this thing. We automate that and take that all away from him and, and uh, you know, let him focus on what he does best is run his factory. How are you guys thinking through accuracy? I, I mean, with um, so many of these applications, the, the Gen AI capability will, it's a, it's a great way for me to think through a problem, but there's definitely still a lot of user filtering that needs to happen on my end. And when you think about critical infrastructure uh, and putting an AI model in there into something that Siemens would be running. Um, hmm. Yeah. How are you yeah. guys thinking about like risk and accuracy with these models? 
Yeah, exactly. And then we, we've got a lot of interaction with sort of our uh, compliance teams and things like this internally as well. But well, one of the key things and the simplest that thing in what we do is make sure that it's very obvious where that outputs come from, right? So people actually know that they're talking to a computer system um, because, you know, they could get the impression that you're actually talking to somebody and maybe in a, a remote support center that's giving that output to you. But a key aspect in everything that we do is, is thinking in the paradigm of our system being a decision support system. Okay. And there always ends up being a human in the loop. Even, you know, you know, never mind the JNEI part. If we're just telling you that something's become unusual on a machine, you know, the, 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 the expectation isn't that you're, you know, you're creating an order for a spare parts for that machine without even looking at it. You know, probably the first thing you're going to do is some sort of visual inspection, verify what's going on. So there's always that paradigm as well. And then another big aspect that, that we're experiencing, and I hear a lot of other people in you know, sort of different in different areas and sectors and different podcasts and things talking about it, it, is how you implement the guardrails in and around the AI system, right? Because um, what you want to make sure is that it's got the ability to actually say it doesn't know, right? And that there's a general tendency for the system to always want to give you some sort of output and some sort of answer, right? So you've got to build those guardrails in and and make sure that it understands the context in which it's working in. Yeah. Um, yeah, you, you don't want to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But, but it's just the fact that maybe there's no information that exists on the repair for this type of machine rather than thinking, be like, well, let's, let's just, just, just pull some stuff together and make something up. Right. Um, but another area that sort of I've got a little bit of fear about as well is um, people's perceptions that it will be truly prescriptive in what you have to do. And I've got cautions where, you know, if, if you're starting to put this stuff maybe onto an HMI display on a, on a machine, you don't quite know if that person that's reading it and getting those actions is qualified to do the task that you're maybe directing them to. You know, maybe before you open up the, the cabinet in the back of a machine, you, you probably have to be, you know, have a certain certifications and certain qualifications. So we've got to make sure that people are still following their maintenance policies and maintenance procedures and keeping themselves safe. You know, when you guys think about Gen AI at, at Sensei, so like thinking backwards, I, I'm <laughs> curious about like, I guess what you would, you know, on, on this show we call it wrong side of impossible, but like, was there kind of a technical aha moment that made, you know, the secret sauce that ended up being why you got acquired possible, you know, as you think backwards, maybe three to five years ago. And now zooming forward, can you, it, it, I guess I'm looking for like the connective tissue between that moment and, mm -hmm. you know, what Siemens is really excited about going forward. Like what, what yeah. their thesis in this space is. Can you tell, uh, paint us a little picture there? Yeah. So, so, I mean, within Siemens, it's actually quite an exciting time. There's a lot of transformation going on within the business. You know, there's uh, obviously, you know, it, it, there's a lot of history there. There's a lot of momentum in what they do. Um, but Really, it's trying to adapt more to be um, more of a service-oriented and software-oriented company. Um, and having, um, you know, so some of the, the traits that you maybe find within startups like Sensei, you know, some of the culture and the way that we work in a kind of an agile manner, some of the ways that we construct and build teams. Um, and, and I'm seeing that around me, right? Because one of the the fears and trepidations you have as a founder, you know, when you, you've created this thing, you, you really, you, you know, it's still quite fragile, your company, and you're going into a larger organization. Um, but I really feel that within Siemens that, you know, that some of the things and the ways of working that we have, whether it's our culture and our processes, they're flexing more towards our ways of working, which is great. You know, I've seen certain, you know, product lifecycle processes being adapted to suit things that we do, which is like, uh, you know, continual deployment of our codes. You know, we are deploying out to a cloud system. We'll maybe do 10 to 50 deploys a day. And um, this, you know, was initially was, was quite surprising, you know, to some people that are more used to waterfall software development methodologies. But now we've helped to, you know, integrate our processes into Siemens processes. Um, and I think the, the, the trigger really that we've saw us, we saw within the, the work, cause we, we, we worked with Siemens before and partnered with them and we're working with a number of different customers in their internal factories. And I believe what they liked a lot about what we were doing at Sensei was that we were holding really fast to this vision that we had about predictive maintenance and the fact that it was a, it was a horizontal solution and not a vertical. Now, what I mean by that is a lot of examples and a lot of companies will go creating either sector by sector specific 
condition monitoring predictive maintenance solutions, or even in the worst case, very machine specific solutions. And there was some of that had gone on within Siemens and they'd realized that what we developed at Sensei could work just as easily on a machine that, uh, sorry, on a, in a company that makes cars or chocolate bars or is smelting aluminium, because fundamentally what you're trying to do is understand problems with rotating machinery. It doesn't matter the scale, it doesn't matter the application, it's still the same problem. Uh, and that's how we have a really wide diversity of clients. Um, and some clients, you know, we're connected up to thousands of machines in single factories, you know, this and, and then this, this was really interesting. Um, and, and now what's amazing for me is that we were a cloud app and the, the, the bottleneck that we had before was connectivity. Well, I'm in within one of the greatest connectivity companies within uh, the industrial space. So that problem has gone away now too. Yeah. Oh, it's a great feeling. What, what's next for, I mean, I think, I, I, it would be very difficult for you to ask the answer the question, what's next for Siemens, but what's next for Siemens through the lens of, you know, what you're excited about and your kind of worldview over there? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a, there's a whole initiative taking place, um, described as the, the, the Siemens accelerator. Uh, and, and, and what this is, is it's actually looking at how do you take a lot of different technologies and combine them in a way that you've got a, a marketplace and people can pick and mix and create their own solutions. But this isn't only Siemens technology. This is looking at bringing in best in breed sort of partners and third party organizations, whether they're providing services, sensors, or, or very, very, uh, very specific apps and things that, that work into different sectors. And for me, this is great because, you know, in, when we, before the acquisition, we were very much a partner centric organization. We realized that's the way to scale, uh, and, and being quite humble about what you can do and, and looking for other people with other strengths. So being part of that Siemens accelerator movement uh, for me is, 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 is really exciting. Last question, uh, put you on the spot a little bit. Um, you know, and, and if the answer is you've been heads down for a number of years and not sure that's fine, uh, who out there in IOT land, especially gen AI, do you think is doing good work that not enough folks are talking about? Yeah, from a Gen AI perspective, maybe that's a little bit um, tricky off top. But I'm, I'm thinking from a from a, a cool IoT perspective. You know, there's some really interesting technologies related to like wireless sensing. Um, there's a, there's some interesting work coming out of uh, out of a couple of companies that that, that, that we're closely uh, in, in contact with. that are using technologies like WirePass. Um, and there's you know there's there's, there's a company. Uh, Trion in Finland and a company L Watch in, in Norway um, that were really interested in the way that they've solved this wireless technology problem and made it sort of super robust in what are really noisy industrial environments where you know your more standard Bluetooths and Wi-Fi's can struggle. Um, that's that's super super cool. Cool. All right. Well, that sounds like great guests for future episodes. Rob, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. And thank you for listening. Join us next time as we meet with another guest to talk about things that went wrong on a journey that went right. If you're out there trying to figure out how to get started with your IoT project, I've got some news. Very Technology has just published an ebook called How to Choose the Right IoT Company. It's a guide designed to help you ask the right questions, narrow down your search, and find the right partner. You can find it on our website at verytechnology.com.